wonder if you've ever heard of a man named Edward Kimball. He lived in Massachusetts back in the 19th century, and at the age of 40, he learned he was going to die, and he had very little time to live. The clock was ticking. And he didn't have much of an education, but he did teach a Sunday school class of 15 uh, young people. And after he'd been in a service where the pastor of his church had preached on evangelism, he set out to, in the time he had remaining, to win every member of his class to the Lord. Kimball had to overcome fear. Uh, and one day he was going to visit one of these, these young men who worked in a shoe store. He wanted to go in, and he was terrified, actually, to do so. He wanted to go and visit this boy called Dwight. And he writes this in his journal. I was determined to speak to him about Christ about his, and about his soul. And I started down to Holton's boot store. When I was nearly there, I began to wonder whether I ought to go in during business hours. I thought my call into the shop might embarrass the boy and that when I went away, the other clerks would ask who I was and taunt him with my efforts in trying to make him a good boy. In the meantime, I had passed the store, and discovering this, I determined to make a dash for it and to have it over with at once. I found him in the back part of the building, wrapping shoes. I went up to him at once, and putting my hand on his shoulder, I made what I felt afterwards was a very weak plea for Christ. I simply told him of Christ's love for him and of the love Christ wanted in return. That was all there was. It seemed the young man was just ready for the light that broke upon him. And there in the back of the shoe store in Boston, D.L. Moody gave himself and his life to Christ. Isn't that an amazing story? D.L. Moody went on to become one of the greatest evangelists in his day. He preached to an estimated 100 million people. Can you believe that? In the 19th century. He went to England and he worked a profound change in the ministry of a man called F.B. Mayer. F.B. Mayer and his new evangelistic fervor, influenced a man called J. Wilbur Chapman. Chapman helped in the ministry of converted baseball player Billy Sunday, who had a profound effect on another man called Mordecai Ham, and Mordecai Ham, holding a revival in North Carolina, led Billy Graham to Christ. And all because Edward Kimball, this Sunday school teacher, plucked up the nerve and went to talk to and to challenge a member of his Sunday school class. Back in England, just five years earlier, a 15-year-old boy named Charles Haddon Spurgeon ducked into a Methodist chapel, and he'd, well, he'd gone in there actually just to escape the snow. It was bad weather. There were only about a dozen people in attendance in the church, and the minister himself hadn't been able to make it because of the snow. So an unknown substitute lay preacher stepped into the pulpit and read his text, Isaiah 45, verse 22. He read, Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Spurgeon records this in his biography. He had not much to say, thank God, for that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. <laughs> I love it. And there was nothing needed by me, at any rate, except this text. Then stopping, he pointed to where I was sitting under the gallery and said, that young man there looks very miserable. And he shouted, as only a primitive Methodist can, look, look, young man, look now. Then I had this vision, not a vision to my eyes, but to my heart. I saw what a saviour Christ was. Now I can never tell you how it was, but I no sooner saw him as I was to believe, uh, whom I was to believe, then I also understood what it was to believe. And I did believe in one moment. And as the snow fell on my road home from that little house of prayer, I thought every snowflake talked to me and told of the pardon I had found, for I was white as driven snow. Spurgeon, you probably know, became a pastor. He went on to preach in person 13 times a week. That's slightly embarrassing, isn't it, for any other minister? He gathered the largest church of his day, and he could make himself heard in a crowd of 23,000 people with no, no amplification. 
In print, he published some 18 million words, selling over 56 million copies of his sermons in nearly 40 languages, all within his own lifetime. Most, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's incredible, this. More Londoners turned out for Spurgeon's funeral than they did for Charles Dickens just, just previously. Now, no one's heard of Edward Kimball, and we don't have a record of the name of the man who was so instrumental in bringing Spurgeon to Christ. But God used these men to achieve great things for his kingdom. And God has always done that. If you're familiar with the scriptures, you'll know that. He still today uses ordinary men and women and children to do great things for him. And I want to encourage you with that this morning. In this last section of chapter 18 of the book of Acts, we have the names of some such people actually here. A few of those who played an important part in the story of the spread of the church, but about whom we know, we know relatively little, really, if anything. And we're going to try and look at some of them this morning, and I, I hope you'll see how they might encourage us and challenge us today. So that's what we're going to do this morning. But, but first of all, in the first half of what we read, if you can get it in front of you, it'd be helpful. We're going to just catch up with what Paul is doing. Paul's the character we know, isn't it, in, in the book of, of Acts. And the first half of our reading then, verses 18 to 23, records basically in summary, it records Paul's itinerary, okay, his traveling itinerary, as he now leaves Corinth, where he was last time we were with him, and he makes his way back to his sending church in Antioch. He stops off at uh, Ephesus, where he promises to return, Lord willing. And he probably stops off also in Jerusalem. After this, according to verse 23, Paul seems to go on a brief trip. I mean, it's, it's just given a sentence, isn't it? But he visits the, some of the churches, I think, that were planted uh, in his first missionary trip to, to South Turkey. So he does a circular to encourage them. It's all kind of... You know, just keeping things neat, isn't it, in, in the book? Well, let's have a just quick look at this. I, I want to talk about something that might be a slightly distracting detail in the text first, just to get that out of the way. And it is the matter, in verse 18, of Paul's vow. I wonder if you, you know, your ears pricked up when you heard that. What is going on there with Paul and this vow? Well, unfortunately, Luke doesn't really elaborate for us. And you kind of get the reading, as you often do reading through the scriptures, uh, that, that perhaps, and especially his Jewish readers, would have understand, understood something that we don't in this text, right? Now, first of all, then, for us, really, to, to answer the question, was it okay for Paul to make a vow? After all, Jesus taught, Matthew chapter 5, I say to you, says Jesus, do not take an oath at all. We can probably pop these words up on the screen to look at them. Either by heaven, for it is God's throne, or by earth, for it is his footstool, or by Jerusalem, for it is the city of the great king. And do not take an oath by your head, for you cannot make one hair white or black. Let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more Anything more than this comes from evil. Okay, what's going on here? Now, as I understand what Jesus is saying here, Jesus is challenging the teaching of his day. The, you know, he's always dealing with these hypocritical religious leaders, and he's dealing with that. They seem to have taught this system where you could take an oath or a vow by something. That's what you did. And that wasn't unusual. So in the text here, we've got heaven or earth or Jerusalem or even your head as an example. I swear by my head. And depending on what the thing was that you swore by, this is the key, it was more or less binding. It was more or less serious if you broke your vow, depending on what you swore your oath or your vow on. This is what Jesus has a problem with. Later in Matthew, Jesus actually says this to their faces. Listen to Matthew 23. He says, Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it's nothing. But if anyone swears by the gold of the temple, well, then he is bound by his oath. You see what's going on? To be clear then, the Christian should never take a vow 
unless uh, that, that they have, uh, uh, well, they shouldn't take a vow unless they have absolutely no intention of trying to wriggle out of it later or to look for a loophole. That's really what Jesus is saying here. For example, you know, in a week's time, there will be vows said in this very building. We take a vow in marriage, don't we? And we should do so then without even thinking for a moment or contemplating the possibility. Well, if it all goes wrong, I can always get a divorce and have another go. That is not the heart of the Christian. That's not how you take a vow. Jesus says that the standard of his kingdom is that your yes is yes and your no is no. No ifs or buts or conditions allowed. Adding an object to swear by and thereby, you know, making it stronger or making it weaker opens the way for deceit and unfaithfulness, which Jesus says comes from evil. So Paul's not wrong to make a vow here. Well, that's a relief, isn't it, for, for poor old Paul and for us. And it seems most likely, actually, what's going on here in this verse here is that Paul is coming to the end of a Nazarite vow. Perhaps you're familiar with that. The Nazarite vow was made to signify that a person had pledged to be absolutely devoted and set apart to God. You can read all about it in Numbers chapter 6. It involved abstaining from wine, actually abstaining from all grape products, and staying away from dead bodies. And it involved, I think the thing that we probably mostly know, not cutting your hair for the period of time that this vow had been taken. So Paul probably by this point looked like a bit of a hippie. At the end of this period then, the participant would cut their hair off. You can read about this in number six. And he would go to make an offering at the temple and he would take the hair with him and burn the hair as an offering to God along with the sacrifice at the temple. It's weird to our ears, isn't it? But this is what they did. Now, perhaps Paul had taken this vow while he was living in Corinth. Remember, Corinth was the sin city of his day. Now, it's just conjecture, but I think that would make sense here. He could then shave his head on departure and then take his hair with him to offer at the temple in Jerusalem, uh, which is indicated in verse 22 by, by going up when he arrives over in, in Palestine. And it would then signify to his critics that despite his association with the Gentiles, despite the fact that you might have heard that actually Jesus had, kind of, sorry, Paul had actually turned his back on the synagogue and said, done with you, going to the Gentiles, despite that, and word may be getting round about that, he had maintained his devotion to God, and you would know it. He was still a full-on Jew under a Nazarite vow the whole time he was there. Well, come and chat to me if you have another theory. I just wanted to sweep away the distractions in the text by just dealing with that, but now let's look at what we've got here in the rest of these verses. And here's what I was thinking about as I, you know, I have to confess, when I was looking at this uh, this week, I was scratching around thinking, what do I preach on in this text? I mean, they don't want to lecture on vows and, and all of this sort of stuff. And so I has, had a look around online. I wonder what other people have drawn out of this text. And to my surprise, nobody has preached on this particular text that I can find uh, online. Tell me if you do find one. Uh, they always inc increase the section because I want to preach about something else. But I just think it's, it's really interesting. What struck me was, as we go through the second half of the book of Acts, isn't it true? We get these missionary journeys, and we actually think of, of the second half of the book of Acts as really Paul's missionary journeys, right? That's really largely the content of, of what it is. And it is. But Paul was a team player. And I want us to think about that a little bit this morning. He seems to always be gathering workers and gathering apprentices wherever he goes. Now, I did a quick scan through the New Testament, and I found all the names of traveling companions of Paul. It's very interesting. So I didn't, I didn't include people who were just supporting him in various cities and towns, just those who actually went with Paul and traveled with him to help him. You've got Aristarchus, Barnabas, Epaphras, Erastus, Timothy, Trophimus, Gaius, John Mark, Luke, 
Onesimus, Philemon, Silas, and Titus. And then here in verse 18, Paul stayed in Corinth for some time. Then he left the brothers and sailed for Syria, accompanied by Priscilla and Aquila. You see, the first thing that really strikes you here is that Paul, that, that, that Paul doesn't like to go it alone in ministry. He's not one for just working on his own. Sometimes he's forced to, but that's not his ideal. This is what fellowship looks like, really, in the gospel, isn't it? And it is an essential thing for God's people. We should take this seriously. God gave us each other so that we would be, dis- be supported in what we do. And I think we can learn a really valuable lesson from Paul here about thinking about who, who can you involve, who can you bring along with you in the things that you do for the Lord. A great way of discipling the next generation, really, is simply to invite them to join you in what you do. Have you ever thought about that? And I wonder, could you invite someone to join you in doing the refreshments? You know, they're not on the rotor, but you just sort of think, do you know what? There's someone I really that, that, that could do with being really brought along and discipled. I'll just bring them along with me to do this or to do that, to clean, to visit someone, to go out and distribute leaflets in the neighbourhood. I'll just no, I'll just give them a call. Maybe they'll come with me. A friend of mine used to be fond of of saying, you know, we shouldn't be a church of lone rangers. You don't you shouldn't have lone rangers. In the church, and then he would pause and then think, you know, thinking about it, actually, even the Lone Ranger had Tonto, if you know the story. Even, he, even the Lone Ranger wasn't a Lone Ranger, and neither should we be. It's a good lesson to learn, isn't it? I wonder who you could involve in doing things with you. But let's turn our attention over then to this lovely couple, Aquila and Priscilla. Now, clearly, Paul had really hit it off with Aquila and Priscilla. And their friendship was not purely based on the fact that they were all of them trained in sort of leather work and tent making. These three compadres here shared a heart for the gospel. They wanted to share the gospel with people. And what a brilliant couple they were when you look at them. They're always named together. Though sometimes, actually, as you look through the Bible, use a concordance on this, sometimes the Bible records their names the other way round. It doesn't matter which way around you put it, because they're kind of a unit together. They're an amazing husband and wife team, both of them essential in the ministry that they do together. And they were refugees, we saw last week, coming from Rome, where they've been thrown out. And, and, and think about it, they've only just arrived and set up home in Corinth, and what's the first thing they do? The first gift that they put to use is that of hospitality. I don't even know what state their home was in yet. Boxes probably still not unpacked. But they open their home to Paul. And they look after him when he's arrived, first of all, in Corinth. It's an instant kinship, isn't there? Because they love the gospel. And they have a desire to share what, uh, whatever support that they can to, to help in the ministry of the gospel. You know, a Christian marriage is a wonderful thing when both partners are united together in Christ and pulling together in that same glorious cause. That is a beautiful thing, isn't it? And those of you who are married, I just want to ask you, think about it. What is your passion together as a couple? What do you work together for? I mean, you'll be doing different things individually, I know that. But what do you work together for? What's your heart together about? It, what, what are your plans together? Is it, is it just for a comfortable home? Some big memorable holidays to go on? The best possible education or start in life for your children? Well, those are not necessarily bad things. In actual fact, some of them are quite prudent, aren't they? And they're good things. But oh, that more Christian couples would put the cause of Christ at the top of their priorities together. And would live intentionally for him together. And enjoy that teamwork together in the gospel. When Paul left Corinth, this couple went with him. They upped sticks and went with him. Why'd they do that? Because why not, I guess? They're lightweight and portable and devoted to this cause. They haven't put down roots to hinder them. 
And we don't know if they had any children. Actually seems like they didn't, doesn't it? But though they had no biological children, they did seem to open their hearts and their homes, didn't they, to spiritual children constantly. One of those was a man named Apollos. Let's turn and look at him just for a moment. We encounter him in the next section here, if you look, in verses 24 to 28. Priscilla and Aquila have remained in Ephesus while Paul heads off on the rest of that journey that we just shared the itinerary of. But their home is not empty for long, is it, Priscilla and Aquila? Have a look, verse 24. Meanwhile, a Jew named Apollos, a native of Alexandria, came to Ephesus. He was a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the scriptures. He'd been instructed in the way of the Lord and spoke with great fervor and taught about Jesus accurately, though he only knew the baptism of John. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they invited him into their home and explained to him the way of God more adequately. Apollos. Apollos is an uh, Alexandrian, we're told, from the city of Alexandria. And Alexandria was the academic city of the Roman world. It was famous for its library and it was famous for its scholars and philosophers. Some estimate that at the height of, of its library in this great city, it housed as many as 400,000 scrolls. That is a lot of books. And it was home to the great Jewish philosopher Philo, who was a contemporary of the Lord Jesus Christ. Philo was famous for interpreting the Old Testament using allegory. So he would look at those narrative stories and say, well, not necessarily so. It's probably more of, a, of an allegory, a picture. It's symbolic in its meaning. He did this because he wanted to try and reconcile the Old Testament with Greek philosophy and bring it into the sort of Greek world. And going by what we're told about Apollos then, he would have been a man able to engage with the best of the scholars and the philosophers of his hometown. Look at what we're told about him. Verse 24 there, he's a learned man with a thorough knowledge of the Old Testament scriptures, knows his Bible back to front. The word translated there actually as, as learned or learned, it, it could also mean eloquent. In fact, almost certainly does. So we're talking about a man who is an impressive communicator, uh, probably one of these people that, that you got in Corinth quite a lot. Yeah, really good at presenting. Whether it's right or wrong, just a great presenter, and everybody would just believe you when you spoke. A great communicator. And what's, what's more, in verse 25, that learning and that eloquence was accompanied by great enthusiasm. Well, he's described as having great fervor, fervor, isn't it? Luke tells us that it was clear also that he had been instructed in the way of the Lord. And what he said about Jesus then, for its part, what he knew of Jesus was accurate. He was a good teacher. But we're told there's a problem in that it's not complete what he's teaching about Jesus. What was missing? Well, he only knew the baptism of John. And we're going to meet some more disciples of John when we get into chapter 19 after the summer holidays. But the question I think we need to address here is, what's lacking? What's missing in the baptism of John the Baptist? What was missing there? It was a good question to ask at the moment because Tiago spent a little bit of time on this with us, uh, with us last week, didn't he? Again, Luke is not very forthcoming with the details here, but I think we can piece it together. See, John's job, John the Baptist's job, was to announce the coming of Jesus Christ, the Messiah. How do you get ready for God's king coming? How do you get ready for the Messiah coming? Well, John told them they needed to repent. They needed to turn. That was actually what John the, Baptins, John the Baptist's baptism actually signified, wasn't it? A recognition of your sinfulness and a decision, a resolve to turn away from your sin and then to live a life that showed the fruit of that change. And you were to do that all in readiness for the arrival of God's King, the Messiah who was coming. And that was all very good. But it wasn't sufficient, was it? Even John recognised this, didn't he? He confessed that all he could do 
will soak people with water, but that the Messiah, when he arrived, he would baptise people with the Holy Spirit. And so when Jesus came to John to be baptised, look at what John says in Matthew chapter 3. We read that John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you. And do you come to me? John got it, didn't he? John knew the limitations of what his baptism meant, what his ministry could do. John could only clean the outside. Jesus would have to come to clean the inside. John taught about resolving to live God's way. But the Holy Spirit would enable us to live God's way. He would clothe us with power to fulfill our calling. Let me just point out, you know, repentance is an essential thing, isn't it? To turn from our sin. Being, but being sorry for your sin is just not enough. You need to also come to Jesus. You need his help. You need his salvation. The gospel is not a message of just cleaning yourself up. It's a message of coming to Christ to be cleansed. And so this is a serious lag for Apollos. Jesus did not want his disciples to start their mission until they had been, as he put it, clothed with power from on high when the Holy Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. And Priscilla and Aquila, clearly, they, they see Apollos in the synagogue and they see the amazing potential that this man has, but they very quickly realise, don't they, something, something's missing here. This guy's great, but there is something just missing. As Tiago showed us last Sunday, even the least, says Jesus, in the kingdom, those baptised with the Spirit by him, is greater than the greatest of those who are only born of woman, flesh. All they have to rely on is flesh. That's all they have to help them. And so Aquila and Priscilla, together, and it is together, isn't it? They take Apollos aside. They take him into their home, probably give him a nice meal. And then they explain to him the way of God more adequately. He moves from just the baptism of John to full faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is wonderful, isn't it? First, it shows us that we can be useful in God's kingdom, actually, before we've got all of our theology sorted out. We can all breathe a sigh of relief about that, even if we ever do get all of our theology sorted out. Because it's not about how much we know, but about who we know, and a willingness to testify to what we know is true about the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you willing to do that? And secondly, I can't help but be struck, struck by the humility of Apollos. He's a great illustration in that, isn't he? I mean, this man is a beast intellectually, isn't he? He has a massive intellect, the best kind of schooling, bags of talent and ability, tons of energy and enthusiasm. I mean, he's a dream person to have in your church, isn't he? And yet, he doesn't let his ego get in the way of a chance to learn the way of God more adequately, even from an ordinary couple who've just arrived in town and set up the pop-up leatherwork and tent-making business. He's willing to go to their home and to be taught. I love the idea, the, the picture of perhaps Priscilla there, with that sort of irresistible charm and mothering character, just tenderly correcting this, this scholar and him sitting there eagerly listening, soaking in the word of God. May God grant each of us to have that same kind of teachable spirit, brothers and sisters. We'd be able to learn. And may we always recognise the dignity of all forms of teaching the ways of God to others. Whether it's by preaching or Bible studies, or whether it's raising the next generation of Christian scholars and leaders down the corridor in our Sunday schools. This chapter ends with the sending of Apollos to Corinth, where we're told, on arriving, verse 27, he was a great help to those who by grace had believed. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public debate, proving from the scriptures 
that Jesus was the Christ. That is now the theme of his preaching, isn't it? I'm going to show you that Jesus is the Christ. You need to put your trust in him. And so Apollos was mightily used by the Lord. And yet two things, just as we close this morning. First, we never really talk about him. I mean, he's quite an amazing character, huge talent, and yet we never talk about him. When did you last hear a sermon about Apollos or learn anything about him? He's an unsung hero, enabled by two more unsung heroes. But secondly, we don't really need to. Other than to perhaps imitate those things that were good about him, his, his humility and his, his love of the ways of the Lord, we can have a propensity, can't we, towards hero worship. I guess we all do it. We have those that we just love to listen to them teach. We love to elevate them and think, yeah, really. We and do you know that is not a good thing in the church? Paul sets us straight, actually, when he writes to the church in Corinth these words. He says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. When one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos? What is Paul? Only servants through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, brothers and sisters, but only God who makes things grow. The Church of Christ is, is a body of many parts, isn't it? All of which, from the greatest to the least, is absolutely indispensable. Absolutely indispensable. Whatever it is, you contribute to this local body of Christ, from clean facilities to an open home that welcomes people, is absolutely essential to the whole. I don't know who said it, but it's both dignifying and humbling in its truth that there is no such thing as a great man or woman of God. Only men and a great God.